Hello and uh, welcome to this video on a new cloth solving simulation method for Blender that I've been developing in simulation nodes. Uh, this, this new method can work on any sort of input geometry, it doesn't have to be a grid, but I'm just using a grid in this case. The reason for this is that I wanted it to be flexible in what I could input to the system so that I didn't have to input something with a specific mesh structure for it to work. I could input anything with any index values and it would always work. Um, and I haven't really seen that so far. And then I, I wanted something that I could tear, um, which I can do with this empty, as you can see. I can uh, break the cloth apart, um, which is pretty cool. And it, it also creates like these neat little strings as well, um, which is kind of a post post processing effect. But uh, yeah, the solver does actually solve for like uh, string deformation as well. So um, yeah, this is sort of like a a group effort, I guess, because I've been taking bits from other videos that I've seen on simulation nodes. So I'll uh, I'll reference those where I've used them and uh, link to all the videos that I've um, used to help make this. So uh, yeah, you can see I've just condensed this down into one sort of node group, um, which is fairly user friendly, I think. Um, so yeah, it's probably going to be very buggy and whatnot, but uh, so far I've found it to work like pretty decently. So. Yeah, inside the node group, you can see that there's a lot of stuff going on in the simulation zone. And really, it looks a lot more complicated than it is because um, it's just mostly a bunch of constraints that are affecting the position of the cloth to, say, self-collide or collide with other objects. They stay the same length. And yeah, these are mainly what's happening here. The logical processes are up here. So we start off with our frame number here. So this overall block would be like our frame here. And then inside we do a substep. So inside each substep, we update the position based on the velocity. And then we solve the constraints of the simulation, which will uh, change the position again. And then we update the velocity again. So it's, it's fairly simple logically. And the uh, difficult part just comes in knowing what to do for these constraints. So um, in terms of updating the actual velocity and position, uh, all we do is input an acceleration, some dampening amount, and the change in time. And this change in time is going to be equal to our delta time, um, which is 1 over the frame rate. So uh, 1 second divided by the number of frames. And then also uh, we need to divide it by the number of substeps that we're using, because in each substep we're essentially moving a lot slower than we would be over an entire frame. So we divide it by the number of substeps. And then in here, we take our previous velocity, we add the acceleration scaled by the time step, and then we scale it by some dampening amount as our velocity. And where I get this from is just the equation for velocity from acceleration. And then from there, we store our previous position, which uh, we'll use a bit later to calculate our updated velocity. And then from there, we take our velocity, scale it again by the change in time, and add it to our position. So we're doing essentially the same thing we did with the acceleration, but now with velocity and position. And now we start getting into constraints. So there's a few things going on. Um, and the order of these is quite important, I found. So I've been reordering them a fair bit. And um, you'll notice some are inside another repeat zone here, and some are outside. And the ones outside directly just set the position and they don't need to be iterated on multiple times per frame or per step. Um, so they, it's not important for them to be inside here. So I put them outside for speed. And the first one is the collision substep, which collides the cloth with external objects. And uh, this is from uh, CG Matters Cobweb video. And there'll be another constraint from his video as well soon. But essentially all it does is say we have a point outside of a surface. And this is a point on our cloth. We, t we get a vector pointing towards the surface, which is this, uh, just the position minus the position of the nearest surface. We dot product that with the surface normal, so the normal will be something like this. And you can see in this case where it's outside the collision object, these are pointing in opposite directions. So this uh, value will be um, zero or above, basically. Um, but if the point is over here and we calculate a vector like that. You can see these two vectors are now pointing in the same direction. So this dot product and less than will return true. And in that case, we've detected a collision and uh, we want to set the position to the nearest surface position and um, to snap it back to the surface. Uh, I also have another uh, little uh, part here that, that takes the, the distance to the geometry and says if it's less than 0.1, then start considering collisions as well, because we don't care if the normals and 
stuff are pointing in different directions if we're really far away from the object because we know we're not going to be on the wrong side of it. So that's our first collision constraint. Now we jump into our uh, iterative for loop where we iterate on a self-collision constraint and a distance constraint. So first of all, self-collisions. I took this from another video. I can't remember the name, but I'll put the link uh, on the screen. And essentially, uh, this method is, I saw used for particle mechanics to get particles to clump, but I just inverted it for getting them to separate. And it works fairly well at high substeps. So essentially what it does is merge the incoming vertices uh, together to get a midpoint. And the distance that I merge them by is based on their rest length, the edge rest length value. So uh, I store the rest length of the edges over here. Um, this is just the distance between each uh, neighboring point. And then in here, I get the mean value of that and scale it by some amount and then use that as my uh, merge distance. And this gives me the midpoint between two particles, uh, which I can then get a vector pointing away from. So uh, I use that to then scale the, part, the particles apart and by offsetting their position. And I again scale by the time step and the strength of this effect as an input. Um, but yeah, the, the guy who actually made this does a much better job of explaining it, so you should probably check that video. But um, the time step is, uh, again, our sub-step time step divided by our constraint iterations. So the same way that we divided the time step by the number of sub-steps, we have to divide the time step inside the sub-step by the number of iterations to get a consistent um, time, change in time, basically. Um, and I can put that over here for clarity. And then I just have a little switch to say that if we don't care about self collisions, just uh, just bypass it. Basically, if we if we don't want to calculate these, it'll be much faster if we don't. And then the uh, main constraint that makes us behave like cloth is the distance constraint, and this is again from CG Matters Cobweb video. And it essentially uh, says for every single edge, we want to scale the edge based on um, its change from the rest length. So uh, the rest length divided by its current length, so if it gets longer, it scales down and vice versa. Um, but yeah, this is a nested for loop in our simulation, so uh, it is quite slow to solve this constraint, but it's the best one I've found to work so far. Then outside of the um, iteration loop, we do a pin constraint, which just essentially, after all the constraints have been done, we just set the pin position back to its previous position, um, because we don't want pin points to move. And then from there, um, we have to update our velocity. And that's because if you imagine our pinpoint, if we don't update the velocity, then as far as uh, the velocity is concerned, it's still moving down at the same rate as everything else. But in fact, it, it has a velocity of zero. So we need to update this velocity at the end. So we go in here, we take the position minus the previous position divided by the change in time, which is our time step, and set that to be the new velocity. This uh, expression here, frame greater than one, I just did because at frame one, there'll never be a previous position. So I just added in that little uh, setup there. I don't think it makes that much of a difference for this cloth setup, but when I was doing like more basic tests, it did make a difference. So that's why that's in there. And that's in the entire cloth setup um, done basically. So yeah, we just store again our pin and our edge lengths at the beginning and uh, update our position solve our constraints, update our velocity, and loop back again. So that's the entire logical uh, step of this. So uh, yeah, outside of this node group, now we can just input this plane that I have with some uh, faces on it, just a simple grid, and store the UV map so that we can texture this later. Uh, set our pinpoints to be either distance from this object, uh, or we could you know, set it to be something like this, so it does like a sheeted motion. Um, you can really input any expressions that you want in to define your pins. And then uh, we delete uh, points that are in proximity to another empty. And then we can input our collision geometry if we want to. Um, so if I want it to collide with this sphere, for example, um, we can do that. And I also input forces here, the force of gravity minus 10-ish, uh, add in a noise force that changes over time just for some little turbulence effects. And that's our acceleration. But yeah, you can see if we give it a adequate number of substeps, uh, this runs at a reasonable speed and solves the constraints fairly well. This is the raw output of the simulation. So you can see that like 
it's a little bit uh, low low res and not ideal for rendering so we do a couple things to this I just blur the position uh, using a blur attribute node and a set position and then I uh, solidify this using just basically extruding the mesh and rejoining it to itself but I just put it in this node group that imitates the solidify modifier in the menu here so it, it basically does a, a the exact same thing um, and if you're curious to how that works it's just this messy node tree but the main part is just extruding it and rejoining it to itself and then we subdivide this mesh to give it some more polygons and this is sort of a cheap way to imitate simulating it at a higher res and then we uh, do this other little step down at the bottom here uh, this is for tearing basically so you can see as i um uh, as i've you know played this through and moved the empty around we've created some areas where um, the the output has produced a single edge connecting two points and uh, if we don't do anything that won't render basically so uh, I wanted to connect these up with a thin line so we basically have to identify these points by uh, using the edge neighbors node saying if it's less than a certain amount um, then these edges don't aren't connected to many faces so we delete out every edge that isn't that to isolate these and then delete out any remaining faces, uh, convert them to a curve, and then convert them back to a mesh, and we mesh them with a curve circle to make a very thin tube. And then we join that up with our original geometry, and we get a thin line connecting them there. Then give it a material, shade it smooth, and that concludes basically the whole setup for this. So in the material, we can just reference the UV map as normal and give it any texture we want and yeah the cloth will uh, able to form with everything and yeah the the motion seems uh, fairly realistic to me there's probably more constraints I could add to this like bending constraints and stuff to make this more realistic um, but I think this is a great little start to the project and it was fairly interesting so I thought I'd share it with you now in its current state um, but yeah maybe you could find a useful being able to tear cloth in some sort of animation it would be a pretty neat little effect but uh, yeah this whole setup it might be a little bit buggy and could probably do with some refinement in terms of these constraints but the overall idea of it I think is good at this point so yeah thank you very much for watching and um, I'll see you in the next video